Hey everyone, you are listening to another episode of the All Things Private Practice. Today I have a really cool guest who is a CPA and a tax attorney in Charlotte, North Carolina. Daniel Rowe is also an autistic ADHDer, uh, OCD as well, which I think is quite the combination when we're talking about like, a lot of you have reached out to me asking, do you know any neurodivergent affirming tax professionals? Well, here we go. Uh, his firm advises large and small businesses that operate in the space of making people feel good, moved, and this includes focusing on therapists, doctors, coaches, and others who sell their time and their expertise to help improve their clients' lives. So, Daniel, I'm really excited to have you on here because it's a very unique perspective to have both the CPA and tax attorney um, advice and, and thought processes. A lot of our guests who listen own small businesses, and I think a lot of them would say, like, I'm not really a business owner or I'm not equipped to be a business owner because I didn't learn anything about it in school, which is the case for so many medical and mental health professionals. So can you tell us a little bit about anything I missed in your bio that you feel is important and also just why you decided you really wanted to focus on this demographic in your business? So one thing I will add that kind of goes along with my bio is, is another area I practice in is estate planning. And I do that with a lot of people that own their own businesses, own their own practices, have young children. So that's something I do for people in North Carolina and California where I'm licensed to practice law. Oh, so yeah. yeah going to the, the question overall, I guess I can, um, step back for a second and say that I am, I'm recently my own business owner. It's been a little over a year and a half since I started my practices. And before that, I spent all my career working in, in bigger firms, bigger businesses. Um, what I was able to see as I, as I took myself out of that world was that a lot of the ways that my brain works and the things that, that make me good at what I do don't necessarily parallel with what's expected a lot of times at the big firms or the big places. And so, um, that was eye opening, and it's also allowed me to tailor the way I do my work and the clients that I work with to better better serve both the way I work and the way they work. That's a great point and perspective. And I imagine that so many people, myself included, who are listening, had similar experiences if they worked in a corporate structure, community mental health, a medical setting, or practice or group practice where maybe the workplace culture was not neurodivergent affirming, where they had to be there nine to five, regardless of when they got their work done or how their sleep was impacted or how their sensory systems were impacted throughout the day. And then you had to sit in certain meetings that like felt like meetings about meetings. And then you were like, I just want to get the fuck out of here. Like, what, what is happening? This doesn't feel like me. And so many of us leave those places to start our own thing whatever the thing is. And there's a, so much fear, so much self-doubt, so much insecurity that comes with being an entrepreneur. It's like a roller coaster. Like there are days where you're like, best decision I've ever made, wouldn't trade it for the world. And there are days behind the scenes where you're like, you're playing every single role, right? So for those who are listening, taxes are a piece of this. When you're an entrepreneur, taxes are one of those things that come up in conversation where people are pretty afraid of them. And that goes with like quarterly taxes. How do I save enough? Um, I feel like I'm constantly owing the IRS or I'm feeling like I'm not making enough money to really make this worth my while. Do you see a lot of that in from your side of the desk, so to speak? Yeah, and the, the thing that I really, really try to do is make taxes and the topic of it something that's approachable, that doesn't feel so um, just insurmountable and and intimidating and because i feel like that's that's what i realize are the things that i struggle with or the th things that i don't face directly or that i don't have a good handle on or i feel out of control on are the things that really cause me a lot of stress just in the background of, of my brain and so my approach is always to try to explain try to help people actually be empowered and feel like they're in control of their tax situation business situation without trying to make them tax experts, just enough information where they feel confident that, okay, this is not so intimidating. I actually understand what I need to do. Now it's set up. Now it's almost autopilot the way it works. Um, and then we check in throughout the year just to make sure everything is still where we had planned it for it to be, or if things have changed, then we adjust the plans. But 
it is really about empowerment and making people feel like they can do this. Yeah, I think that's a huge piece. And that, that kind of like coincides with starting a business, right? Like when you look at these checklists that people provide of like, this is how you start your PLLC and start your business. And it feels so daunting when you don't know what any of that verbiage means, when you don't know what any of that terminology means or the processes, it almost allows you to like say, I'll, I'll do this some other time. I'm going to put this on the back burner and like, I'll, I'll save this for later, but it feels too intimidating right now. I think when we don't know what we don't know, things feel a lot scarier than they actually are. So by providing just a little bit of knowledge about taxes, it really does bring that like fear and intimidation factor down just a little bit. And if you have the right professional in your corner and you trust them, that also allows for this to be a lot easier because you kind of know this person's got my back. They're going to support me. They're going to kind of advise me on the right decisions that I should be making, which is something I want to talk about. I have a pretty big Facebook group of mental health uh, practitioners in private practice. A lot of people are always looking for accountants. It's just, I feel like it's one of the top five most commonly asked questions. And the things you hear are similar to things that we hear in the therapy world. I called 12 accountants and nobody called me back. I get charged every time I pick up the phone just to ask them a question. I don't really understand why they keep asking me to move to an S-Corp from a PLC. You're kind of smiling because I'm sure you get that question all the time. So any of those things feel like directions you want to move into right now? I kind of, all three of those just resonate with me a lot. The first one going to, you don't get a call back. And I feel probably two reasons for that come to mind one is just the volume of work that cpas have right now and it's sure. just i'm sure other industries feel the same thing but i can speak to the to the cpa world and there's just not enough people wow, able to do the work that is in demand and so maybe that is part of the reason for for lack of a callback the other one i think is one thing i, I realized again having my own practice and stepping back from from working with so many other people i was able to reflect and realize that a lot of the people I work with, I believe are also neurodivergent um, and spend a lot of time masking, trying to, to go with the flow. And I think some things like calling people back are just difficult. Um, I, I struggle with that sometimes too. I go through periods where I just want to check out and I don't really want to communicate with the outside world for a minute um, and then get that burst of energy and then start going through the checklist, calling people back, getting everything done. And so I think those two reasons contribute to it. And, um, the other, you mentioned, um, just why to convert from one type of company to the other. And that, that type of thing does feel intimidating. Um, what I would say is that when you're looking for a CPA or you're looking for a tax attorney, look for someone that their focus is on giving you peace of mind and letting you then run your business. Meaning they're, they're going to give you the information you need enough to get you going but you don't need to spend your time studying the rules, studying the law. That's, that's what they're going to do, but they're going to give you enough information so that you feel like you're making the decisions yourself, but you're making them from an educated place. Um, and so I do, I do a lot of diagramming, drawing, whiteboarding, just trying to show people how things move from one type of business to their personal taxes and, and just being able to compare things for them visually. So that, um, I think the face-to-face -face is also something I hear a lot of times people are lacking with, with their accountants or their attorneys is that so much is just over the phone, um, or email written communication. And so the other thing I would look for is someone that is either in your local area or that is very comfortable getting on zoom or getting on teams and doing the calls with you face-to-face. -face. Cause I do think that that for some people that is very, very helpful. And then the part about the getting billed for little questions here and there. That is a concern, and and I think both sides of the equation struggle with that. So the professional doesn't want people not to call them and, and wait until they've already done something, and now we're trying to fix it. But the the practitioner doesn't want to call and get charged for the for the time spent. So I most of my engagements and the way I, I arrange things are on fixed fees, where it's almost certain things are almost a menu pricing, where you know exactly what it's going to be. I I account for the fact that I'm going to be doing check-ins, phone calls, these quick questions here and there type of things. Um, that's all built in so that when you have a fixed price and we also break it down for, for some, if they prefer to do it monthly. So I say, you know, this is the total cost, but we're just going to do it over 12 months in periodic 
So you have the same payment every month. And so they get hit with a big bill at tax time um, or, or, you know, when all the work's being done. So yeah, that's, that's part of the way we deal with those concerns. So those are three great answers. I want to unpack each one and I want to track them and like, let's try to keep track of what you were saying. Um, first, the phone call piece. Great points, right? Like, one, maybe it's a private practitioner like yourself who maybe maybe it's behind the scenes just you doing everything, which is so typical for a lot of mental health therapists. So like, I always try to see both sides. Like, if you hear mental health therapists aren't calling people back, there could be so many reasons for that. It could be that they're handling all the admin tasks. Maybe they are neurodivergent and their executive functioning is just really struggling and it's hard to like do things sequentially or do things in order or do things like that require that extra amount of energy that you don't have. So that's first and foremost. I'm so glad you mentioned that. Also, I feel like a lot of people call tax professionals during tax time when they're like freaking out that, hey, I didn't prepare the way I probably should have. And it's April 14th and nobody's calling me back. And it's like, well, we're kind of at like crunch time for folks that are doing these things. So that's also something I want everyone to think about, like get proactively prepared find that person sooner than later, not on the last week of the uh, final deadline and month. Um, one of my best friends is an accountant and I've been in his office during the week of like April 15th and it's just chaos. So I'm like, yeah, I get it. Um, the other thing is having someone who is willing to like communicate with you in a way that works for you, I think is super important. So like you said, instead of just emails and phone calls, if that's not how you retain and absorb and understand information and you really need someone who's willing to get on Zoom or Teams or meet face-to-face, -face, I think those are important questions to ask when you're hiring a CPA or a tax professional. Like, how do you like to communicate? What What's the best way? Are you willing to accommodate the things that I need? And I think that we should be interviewing to some degree, not like extensively, our CPAs, our, our, our tax professionals, our support team, like our boardroom of our businesses. We should not just pick because someone was like, oh, I worked with this person. Just give them a call. That helps. But I think you should still ask a couple of questions that are important for you to know. Similarly to when someone calls a therapist and that person wants to ask 10 or 15 minutes worth of questions about like, what kind of therapy do you take my insurance? What are your rates? Like, where are you located? Those things are important to have conversations about. I also think there has to be some semblance of rapport when you're working with someone who's so involved in your financials because it's a major source of stress in our lives. Um, so I, I like these answers and I think it just goes to show what it means when we have someone who wants to show up for the professionals who are doing this type of work and gets their day to day because there's just an enormous amount of stress financially that goes into business ownership. And I think for whatever reason, mental health professionals and money, it's just a big area of struggle and concern. So there's almost this mentality of like, this person wants to move me from my PLLC to an S-Corp. I think they're just trying to like get over on me or charge me extra money this year. And it's like, you hear that a lot. And sometimes that's probably true, right? But for the most part, you have to trust the person that you hired who's doing the work for you and, and doing the things that you don't know how to do. It's, it's very vulnerable. I think sharing that type of information with someone, your finances, your, your personal thing, because you really have to get into that person's life, know about if they just got married, if they got divorced, if they're having kids, they bought a house. And so one other thing I would look for when you're, when you're sort of interviewing these professionals is a CPA or a tax attorney that is willing to be sort of a hub for you, meaning they can connect and work with other advisors for you. So um, not, they're not necessarily doing everything themselves, but they bring in the right professionals and coordinate things. So maybe they connect you with the right life insurance person or for your retirement plan, they, they know people that can get you set up with that. And they're willing to coordinate all those different pieces for you so that you're not going out on your own seeking um, and, and having to kind of from scratch to put all those pieces together because they're also integrated. And the CPA really has access to so much information that it's so much more helpful if they're sharing that with others um, and putting all those pieces together for you. Yeah, I agree hundred percent. It's a hell of a lot more helpful to ask your CPA, do you have recommendations of people you work with or work closely with or recommend opposed to just Google searching like life insurance near me or retirement planning near me. 
because you just never know who you're going to connect with. And, right. you know, that it, it's nice to have that team kind of synced up so that you can kind of all look at things uh, together from that perspective. One thing that comes up a lot, bookkeeping. Um, your thoughts on should that be something your CPA is handling? Should that be something you're outsourcing? Should you be doing that yourself? There's so many thoughts on this and like people really struggle with the concept of like, I just have a Google spreadsheet. Well, like I'm just tracking my expenses on there. I hear that a lot, which is fine when you're starting out to some extent, but like as you grow, bookkeeping is very important. I agree. And, and I don't like to give this type of answer, but I will say that, that it sort of depends on your situation and, and how complicated or what you have going on. I will say, I, I think I can make a, a blanket statement on it that I would not just use a Google spreadsheet to keep track of everything and use some type of bookkeeping system. And the reason, um, well, I would say the reason why it depends on your situation is because there are, I, I have a lot of clients that do most of it themselves because right now, the two main products for bookkeeping are QuickBooks Online and Xero, X-E-R-O. Yeah. And they're so intuitive. They're integrated into your bank account, your credit card, that you essentially are going through just categorizing expenses. The AI learns what's what and then starts to prompt you to just basically press OK and, and classify it. So you, I would say you need some help getting it set up initially, building your chart of accounts, determining um, what accounts you're going to have, how it's going to be set up. We, we haven't talked about yet, but what type of business you're going to be. So you need a lot of help up front putting it all together. But then a lot of it can be run on a, on a regular basis without some professional oversight. However, I would recommend that you still do have a CPA, ideally a CPA that, that works with a bookkeeper um, that looks at your financials on, if not monthly, then a quarterly basis and goes over them with you because there's... There's so many opportunities that, that come up and they get missed when you don't know what your income is at a given point in time during the year. And we're waiting till the end of the year to start figuring out estimated payments or retirement plan contributions. And so to be doing that stuff periodically, but you, you need good data to do that. So I would say a lot of it can be done yourself, but there should be some oversight by a professional that, that can check in, get things cleaned up, make sure you're, you know, everything's on, on track. Yeah, I agree. hundred percent. I know when I was a sole proprietor, not making a ton of money when I first started out, my bookkeeping was pretty simple. Now that I own three businesses and there's income coming in from all these sources, it's like, if I was going to try to do that uh, without like support or oversight or at least some accountability or check-in, it would be a disaster. And when my accountant got my stuff at the end of the year, he'd be like, yeah, we, we need to fix so much of this. So thinking about that again, proactively getting prepared and really putting these systems in place to set you up for success financially. Um, we can kind of touch base on business structure. I know that's something that really confuses people too. Um, I think that like starting off, everyone always says, you know, and this is state dependent, everyone who's listening, all of your states have different laws. So I can't speak to all of those things, but I know there is the big debate of like, is it a sole proprietorship? Do I start as a PLLC? What is an LLC versus PLLC? And I can answer all those questions pretty simple, simply. When people start talking about like, I'm going to hire LegalZoom to help me set up my PLLC or this entity or this entity or this entity. What are your thoughts on that? Um, okay. My. Let me use the outsource. Like, this is like a sole owned, pretty straightforward, cut and dry, black and white. I'm opening a private practice. It's not like. I have 20 employees and in different states. So the thing, I mean, the convenience about LegalZoom is that you can just do it all online. You don't have to interact with a person. It is, it's affordable. It's, it's low cost. So you can kind of just get it done and checked off your list. The downside and, and why I typically, there are times where I say, I think you can use LegalZoom and get your stuff done. Why I typically don't is because you're missing the understanding piece. You're missing the, the thought that goes into what you should be doing, what type of business you should be, what the implications are. And so you're missing that, that educational component at the very time that you're forming your business, right? So you, you really need someone that can guide you, that can explain everything that's going on. It may be a case where they explain these things to you. Now, you know what you want to be and you go to LegalZoom to get the documents created. I mean, that's, that's, people do that as well, but I think you need 
some explanation and some understanding of what you're getting into at the beginning that, that needs to come from directly from a person. Yeah, I agree with that. And if, you know, for our neurodivergent folks who are listening, I think that's super important. The understanding component is really crucial because otherwise I think we have this propensity for like, I need to know the why. And if we don't know that when we're running our businesses, it almost feels like our businesses are running us and not the other way around. So just ensuring that you have confidence in talking about this stuff. It doesn't mean you have to know all of the ins and outs, but you should at least know why you're deciding to be a sole proprietor, why you're creating a PLLC, why you're switching to an S Corp. Like these things are important to know. It's not the sexy part of business ownership by any means, but I think we have to spend a little bit of time trying to have an understanding or at least have, again, that like boardroom of people and supports, whether it's an attorney, a CPA, a financial advisor, et cetera, who are advising us on what decisions we should be making and why we should be making them. Super important. And I think the, I mean, I, I learned a lot starting my practices in North Carolina. So we moved from California. I was licensed in California. I had to get licensed in a, in a different state and then had to go through the process of what type of entity can I be? Um, there, there's restrictions on what you can name your practice, depending on which board is, is approving it. And so just going through those steps was very educational for me because those, I, I had previously worked at other accounting firms or at other law firms. I didn't have to go through that process. So doing that, I learned a lot. And that's actually what got me into really wanting to start to do this for other licensed professionals because it is intimidating. It's confusing. Um, it was, it was super confusing to me. I had to sort out a lot of stuff, talk to a lot of different people. I finally put it all together. And now with that information, I feel like I can, I can share that with others in an easy to understand way and get them going. Because I think one of the things that holds people back from starting their own practice, I think you touched on this earlier, but it really is, what am I getting into? What do I need to be aware of? How am I going to handle all these different things that I don't know about? Who can I even go to for help? Um, and I do think the, there's a lot of people that can help you, but a, a CPA is, is one of the keys just because they are so involved in all the aspects of the business and can connect you to other people that can help with those other things like the insurance, the retirement plans, that kind of thing. I agree hundred percent. I think the CPA is like foundational, um, because there are things like, as you grow your business, you can start adding different components. Like, okay, I want to add a biller. Okay. I want to add a marketing team. Okay. I want to add this. But I think from the starting point, like there are things that you should really have in place and a CPA is something that, or someone I always say should be a priority because it's very different running your business than doing your taxes on TurboTax. Like it's just very different. Understanding deductions, maximizing them, protecting yourself, understanding like where your money is going, how much you should be saving. Here's so many horror stories of people who are like, I got to the end of the year and I ended up owing like $30,000 more than I thought I was going to. And now I'm in this repayment plan with the IRS and I can't catch up. So I'm just going to go back to an agency job where I know what to expect every single paycheck. And I just feel like that's not, it's so defeating when you hear stuff like that, because that stuff is preventable if we have the right education and tools in place. Well, this was a great conversation. Daniel, and I appreciate you sharing this because I think this is one of those conversations that we could have like extensions of and go down different pathways because we're just really scratching the surface. But I think that's important to have someone who you hire as your CPA who can help you scratch the surface, who can help you better understand all of these components for your business. So glad to know you're out there. Glad to know you're in North Carolina, two hours away from me. Um, and it's also always nice to meet more neurodivergent business owners who are doing the thing and figuring out ways to best support their systems. And for everyone listening, where can they find you? How can they connect with you? What's the best way for them to uh, start working together? There's two different ways depending on what they need. And if it is CPA and accounting support, they could go to drotax.com and it's D-R-O-W-E tax.com. If it's legal advice, if it is business formation and estate planning, they can go to drolawgroup.com and find me there. Um, also on LinkedIn, Facebook, all those things. Uh, I, I can add one thing to what we just talked about a minute ago, if that's all right. The, 
Yeah. So going back to kind of getting everything set up and setting up your accounting system, uh, one one question that people ask me when they're sort of interviewing me to to work with them is, do you work with other businesses like mine, or what type of businesses do you work with? What industries are you practicing in? And for that, I, I think it is important that someone understands your business and can help you with acquiring various tools that make it run better. So. For example, when, when I'm thinking about setting up QuickBooks or Xero, there's a lot of apps that integrate with them. You can connect your billing to that. You can connect your, your payment systems to that. You can connect to all these different apps that you already have, and they integrate it into the software. But knowing, having someone that understands what you're using, what other tools you're using besides accounting tools is really, really key to help um, kind of streamline things and make your business run a lot better. So I would, I would ask the person, do they work with other professionals? Um, what areas do they do they work in? Do they have experience working with therapists or mental health practitioners? And just get a sense of, do they have other clients like you? Because they learned a lot along the way if they do. So I want to ask that in. I think that's a great piece of advice too. And people are pretty often asking that, like, do you know any accountants who work with private practice therapists, you know, specifically? And I think it's important to, to have a good understanding of the the day-to-day -day and the world that you're in. So really, really important point. Um, want to thank you for coming on and just sharing your advice. All of Daniel's information will be in the show notes so that you can have easy access to all the links that he provided and you can connect with him for either legal advice or tax planning purposes. Um, thanks again for making the time. I appreciate you having me. Thank you. To everyone listening to the All Things Private Practice podcast, new episodes are out every single Saturday on all major platforms and YouTube. Like, download, subscribe, and share. Doubt yourself. Do it anyway. We'll see you next week. <laughs>